very much and uh, keeping pretty close to time as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Burgess is our next speaker. He holds a BA in biochemistry from University of Texas and a PhD in molecular biology from MD Anderson Cancer Center. He is currently president of uh, the Medical Nanotechnologies Incorporated as well as Vice President of Business Development for STEM Style Sciences. He's a co-founder and president of uh, Genome Biosciences and co-founding scientist for Lexicon Genetics. Uh, Dr. Burgess, please. I see that I uh, am the last speaker in session five, so I promise to keep it short and sweet. Uh, thanks to the organizers and to Unithair for the opportunity to come here and speak today. I'm very delighted. I have to admit I've never been to the Quebec area, and it goes without saying that it's absolutely gorgeous here, and it's a far cry from Dallas, Texas, so I am delighted to be here. So Medical Nanotechnologies is an entity that was spun out of a nanotech-focused company called Zyvex Corporation based out of uh, Dallas, Texas early last year. And one of Zyvex's major areas of focus are the solubilization and functionalization of carbon nanotubes and then applying that technology um, to the applied materials sector. Um, they do this through the development and utilization of a proprietary polymer called Kintera, um, which is an Arabic term for the word bridge. And Kintera acts by um, stabilizing carbon nanotubes and allowing them to be solubilized and functionalized in a variety of host matrices. And so what I'm going to talk about to you today is the functionalization of carbon nanotubes, not in the applied materials sector, but in the medical sector. And a lot of what I'm going to say today is actually quite similar to what Randy Lee spoke to you earlier about the gold nanoshells and the use of near IR light, only this is carbon nanotubes and radio frequency waves, uh, but the concepts are very similar. So carbon nanotubes are basically um, like chicken wire of carbon rings that are rolled back upon one another, and you have either single wall carbon nanotubes or multi wall carbon nanotubes in which the tubes fold back upon themselves. Um, these tubes exhibit very unique properties if they're solubilized and if they're functionalized prop, uh, properly in the host material. Um, basically, if that occurs, you get on average of 100 times the strength of steel, but one fifth the weight of steel. And now Zyvex has successfully. Uh, made carbon nanotubes useful in a number of um, host matrices and materials such as epoxies and polyurethanes and other materials. And these are just some examples of um, some of the products that are currently on the market in the sporting goods industry in which they have enhanced these products. Um, examples are road racing and mountain bike frames, sailboat masts, um, golf club shafts, and even the necks of bats. Um, there has been some very significant improvement in the performance of these materials. These bicycle frames are now weighing on average of less than 10 pounds. Um, the sailboat masts um, are much stronger and they don't tend to break during these um, races that occur down in Australia. And uh, a number of the pros now are using golf clubs um, that contain carbon nanotubes in the shafts. It allows for a displacement of the weight from those shafts into the head of the club, which increases the distance based on the torque of the swing. Um, but it also makes the shafts much stiffer. There's not as much flex, so you actually get a lot more accuracy off the tee. And in fact, a number of the um, Little League organizations in the United States have actually now banned um, the use of baseball bats containing carbon nanotubes because the kids just keep hitting it over the fence. Uh, so um, it's really a futuristic, but it's, it's actually applied science in nanotechnology today in the applied materials sector. 
So how do they do this? It's through the use and application of this Conterra polymer. This is a bifunctional polymer that allows for the a reduction in the van der Waals interactions that occur between carbon nanotubes. Normally when you get these tubes from the manufacturer, they're in a tightly wound kind of ball of string um, type format. They interact very tightly with one another through the van der Waals interactions. And this polymer, which is a rigid uh, phenyl ring-based polymer, interacts through what's called pi-electron stacking, so a non-covalent interaction with each individual nanotube, coats it, and allows for a dispersion. The second domain of Kintera is now customizable. It has customizable side chains, and these can be customized to specifically interact with the host material, whether it's a polymer or an epoxy, like uh, polyurethane, something of that nature. And that allows for not only a solubilization in the material, but a stabilization of the carbon nanotubes in that material. And in certain instances, you actually get a lining up of the carbon nanotubes to form a really strong uh, material. So we capitalized on this um, from the biological perspective and designed Conterra so that it had aliphatic customizable side chains that allowed for a very tight hydrophilic interaction with water molecules. Normally, carbon nanotubes by themselves in water um, are in very insoluble. And these are scanning EM images of carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes, I'm sorry, multi wall carbon nanotubes from the manufacturer. This is the insoluble ball of twine type format in which they stick to one another. And then this is in the presence of water um, utilizing Katera, a nice evenly dispersed defined matrix. And so this allows us now to consider the use of carbon nanotubes for biomedical application because we can disperse now in a physiological environment. And this was taken from um, a patent that was filed by one of our former collaborators, a company called Thermed, a number of years ago. Carbon nanotubes exhibit very unique properties in that they heat up very rapidly upon exposure to either radio frequency waves or near IR light. And so the, he the theory here is that introduction of carbon nanotubes that have been solubilized using our polymers into tumorigenic tissue and exposure of those tubes in that tissue to radio frequency waves allows for a rapid heating and a thermal ablation of that unwanted tissue. Again, very similar to what Randy had mentioned um, with the gold nanoshells in the near IR light. So what we've also demonstrated here is that the RF-dependent Conterra solubilized carbon nanotubes uh, thermal conductivity um, is linear with respect to time, is linear with respect to increasing the power or the wattage and it also levels off, but in general is linear with respect to the concentrations. As you increase the concentrations of the carbon nanotubes solubilized with the polymer, what you can see is that the heating rate gradually begins to level off. Um, in this graph, what we have here basically is in the absence of single wall carbon nanotubes in Conterra, you do get some heating over time, exposing um, the solution to radio frequency waves but you also see a concentration-dependent increase in that rate. This is 50 milligrams per liter concentration of carbon nanotubes in Conterra, 250 milligrams. And what we're seeing on average is an increase of around two and, a half sec, uh, two and a half degrees Celsius per second, so a very rapid increase upon exposure to the RF field. So we all know that cancer therapeutics is a very significant market opportunity, but what we're looking at here is really to try to bring something new to the table. And that is we're looking to address um, side effects and potency, to reduce the side effects and increase the potency or efficacy of the therapeutics platform. And we think we may be onto something here. It's a novel therapeutics um, application, but we think we have an opportunity to do that and it either complement or in some cases replace um, radiotherapy and chemotherapy for treating patients. So carbon nanotubes are very unique molecules and we think that they 
make for an ideal platform for cancer therapeutics. Um, they have a very well organized and known structure and the mechanism of action of how we're killing these cells is known and understood. It's simply thermal ablation. Um, so these two aspects and the fact that carbon nanotubes have been classified by the FDA as a medical device is very valuable for us from an FDA approval perspective. Um, we can get um, what we would like to think is a very rapid approval of this um, therapeutic strategy based on the fact that we know exactly what it is we're introducing into the patient. We know the mechanism of action and their medical devices. So they're sensitive to radio frequency waves and near IR light, which allows them to emit heat very rapidly. And they can be functionalized with a variety of molecules if you utilize our, our polymers, Cantera and some of the other polymers that we've developed. And what I mean by that is you can attach using those customizable side chains targeting molecules like antibodies, um, peptides, um, nucleic acids, or other small molecules. And not only do localized injections into the tumors um, to rid the patient of the tumor, tumorigenic material, um, but also to target to specific cancer cells throughout the body. And that's one of our main goals at Medical Nanotechnologies. So these are examples of some of the cancers that we feel are theoretically um, addressable using our carbon nanotube uh, radio frequency wave ablation methodologies. And what I've listed here in the arrows is actually some examples of some preliminary studies I'll show a few, uh, a few slides on where we have some proof of concept data. And that is specifically in cell lines, um, liver and pancreatic cell lines, and liver tumors in rabbits. I might also mention that the one um, type of cancer that we don't think we could effectively treat using this platform is leukemia because it's a circulating type of cancer and we think it would be very difficult to get high enough concentrations of carbon nanotubes um, throughout the circulatory system to treat that. So um, that is one exception. So regarding toxicity of both the polymers that we've been using and the carbon nanotubes themselves, what we've realized is there's very minimal, if any, toxicity, especially in the ranges of which we'd actually be using in a biological or an in vivo setting. So this is the Cantera polymer. You can see as, the, as we increase the concentration of the Cantera polymer and we do cell counts over time, we see a little bit of cell death, um, but, but really nothing that significant. And this is actually the range in which we would be using um, the effective concentration of Cantera. And the same goes for single wall carbon nanotubes in the actual range that would, we would use in vivo, very minimal amount of cell death. Um, you see on average of about 10% if you get way out to about 25 micrograms per mil. Um, and this is uh, in vitro cell counting. Um, so we're fairly confident that we've created a non-toxic system. We've also done some studies on clearance from the circulatory system and we've demonstrated um, that you can get clearance within about 72 hours of all carbon nanotubes injected into the circulatory system. So a very high turnover rate there and they basically clear out through the kidneys. Um, other groups have also shown, and there's been a little bit of controversy here on carbon nanotube toxicity, but more recent studies have suggested that they're just not toxic to animals. Uh, again, this is a little more toxicity data in which we've used uh, not Cantera, but another one of our uh, polymers, polypyrrole, um, that's been solubilized uh, into multi-wall carbon nanotubes and coated on a gold nano wire placed in proximity um, to these normal rat kidney cells and we didn't observe any localized cell death um, over extended periods of time. So the other thing we uh, saw that was a surprise to us um, is that utilizing uh, another polymer that's proprietary um, to our research, PSS in combination with carbon nanotubes, we've demonstrated a very high uh, rate of uptake of carbon nanotubes inside cells and tissue culture. So these are HEC-293 cells, and all the black dots that you see here are accumulations of carbon nanotubes in the cytoplasms of these cells. And what was denoted here by this arrow 
um, is one single, what we think is an endosomal vesicle, and it's moving around. This was a um, series of photographs taken um, over the period of about a second. So it's a very dynamic environment in these cells, and based on that, we believe that this is a non-receptor-mediated endocytosis of these carbon nanotube P-dot solubilized um, structures and they're floating around in these cells, and we think this could be very useful for the possibility of um, combinatorial therapies. And what we'd like to do here is to not only utilize the carbon nanotubes to ablate the cancer cells, but in some instances we could use them through brief RF flashes or flashes of radio frequency waves, burst open these endosomal vesicles inside the cell and deliver a drug inside the cell that might, for example, interact with a kinase. Um, and perform its function there. So we think we have an opportunity here now for a combinatorial type of therapy. Uh, so what we can see here in this slide is um, that cells in tissue culture are very, very efficiently ablated, um, utilizing RF exposure of Kintera conju conjugated carbon nanotubes. So in the absence of carbon nanotubes, which you can see here, and this is propidium iodide stains um, counted by fax caliber fluorescence activated cell sorting. This channel here represents dead cells through PI staining. This is G0, G1, um, S, and G2M channels here. So in the absence of carbon nanotubes, um, but in the presence of a radio frequency wave, you observe um, about 10% cell death. But in the presence of the carbon nanotubes, virtually all the cells shift now into the channel that's PI stained. Very efficient ablation in tissue culture um, using our platform. So our collaborators down at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston took this a step further in white New Zealand rabbits, and they actually used the VX2 tumor um, cell line model, and they transplanted VX2 tumor cells into the livers of these rabbits, and then they allowed the tumors to reach a certain size. And then they took the entire rabbit and exposed the rabbit to a radio frequency wave. Um, I think it was pretty high wattage, um, 600 to 800 watts for about two minutes. And what you can see on the left side here, this is H&E staining, um, which stains both nuclei and cytoplasm of cells. Massive cell death, necrotic cell death is occurring, and the arrow denotes really just a buildup of carbon nanotubes in the region where the cell death has occurred. Tunnel assay, which stains for uh, both apoptotic and necrotic cells, it's really the darkened staining that you see here, shows massive cell death um, in this population. If you don't have the single wall carbon nanotubes, but you just have the polymer that's been injected into these tumors, and the, the rabbits are still exposed to the radio frequency field, um, you see virtually no cell death. In fact, you see active mitosis that's occurring um, in a number of cells. Um, and there's been, there's a little bit of programmed cell death here. I think we have one example here, but in general, an absence of apoptosis or necrosis in the absence of the single wall nanotubes. So the technological advantages, and I've already gone over some of these, the mechanism of action is very well established here. So from an approval perspective, we're pleased about that. We can have efficient conjugating of carbon nanotubes to any targeting agent or drug using the side chains of our polymers. We can disperse very effectively in an aqueous environment, which is essential for in vivo biology. We can deliver either to the outside of cells through binding to receptors or just localized injections, or we can deliver to the insides of cells now, and I've shown a photo of that at very high concentrations using that P-dot polymer. Um, and that then allows for the opportunity for either adjuvant or combination therapies in which we do flash the cells with a brief wave um, of radio frequency waves and allow for a bursting of those endosomes and a delivery of drugs inside cells. The therapeutics manufacture process here is very controllable. We know what we get from the manufacturer of the carbon nanotubes and we can very tightly control the manufacture of the polymers and the conjugation of those two together. Polymer properties are also very well established in addition to the properties of the carbon nanotubes. 
and I mentioned the efficient attachment of molecules to the tubes. So what we now have under works at um, UT Southwestern through collaboration with one of our founders, um, Ellen Vitetta, who's the head of immunology there, is to now attach, using Katera or some of our other polymers, monoclonal antibodies um, to the carbon nanotubes and deliver them to specific cancer cells and hopefully to keep them away from normal cells. These include antibodies HER2, um, which, is, which binds to the Herceptin uh, receptor, which is present in a variety of cancer-specific cells, and Herbitux, which binds very tightly to the EGF receptor, which is overexpressed in colorectal cells. And these other studies will come down the pipeline as needed. But, but the, um, the actual conjugation and formulation of these um, testing agents is underway now at UT. So what we've shown here so far is that we can disperse very effectively in an aqueous environment which allows for the in vivo biology to become a reality. We have very strong efficacy, massive cell death either in vitro or in vivo using this platform. And the toxicity as far as we can tell, our system is minimally toxic to the cells, it's minimally or not toxic at all to the animals, and there are studies that are beginning to be published that also support that claim. The next step for us now is specificity. Can we home in or target these carbon nanotube complexes to specific cells, cancer cells within the body, which will increase the efficacy, I think, of the system even further. Uh, just very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge Zyvex Corporation and Jim Von Ayer for making medical nanotechnologies a reality. These are our founders, Gareth Hughes, Ellen I mentioned, a lot of this work occurred in Rocky Draper's lab, who's also a founder of the company. and He's a professor at UT Dallas. And the last thing I want to say is we are preparing to do a round of financing. So if anyone here is interested in investing in our company, we'd love to hear from you. And this is my contact info. So come find me, I guess, uh, sometime after this session. Thank you very much.